Welcome to the last video of our online TEM course. In this video, we are going to discuss the fine details in the core loss edges. In the previous video, we mentioned in addition to the hydrogenic edge, we have the fine details added onto it. There are two types of fine details. The first is called electron loss near edge structure, illness, and the second one is called extended energy loss fine structure, itself. In the EOS spectrum, following the onset of the ionization edge, this part here is called the near edge fine structure, illness, and this part here is called the extended fine structure, itself. In atoms, we have electrons filling the orbitals. The area enclosed here represents the field states. Notice the y-axis is pointing down, so going down is positive. In eels, we have the core shell electron getting ejected away from the field state into an empty state. The probability of an electron to occupy the empty state is non-uniform. At certain energy level, you have a higher probability, like here. In the eels spectrum, it represents the higher intensity. Similarly, a lower probability at the density of states corresponds to the lower intensity in the EOS spectrum. What this tells us is the illness actually maps the density of available states of an element above the Fermi level. The density of available states is highly sensitive to the type of bonding as well as the charge state. Therefore, the details in illness can offer information on the chemical bonding and the charge state of the elements of interest. You have seen the example on the left from one of the previous videos. The eels spectrum from the graphite is different from the one from diamond. In diamond, the chemical bonding is sp3 hybridization. In graphite, it's sp2 hybridization. Different bonding types causes different density of states above the Fermi levels. This in turn leads to the differences in the EOS spectra. We'll spend more effort on the example on the right. The light blue line shows the EOS spectrum from the metallic copper, and the dark blue line shows the copper signal from copper oxide. From EDS, similar to the carbon case, you will only see one copper peak and you will not be able to tell them apart. There are two major differences. The first is the shape, which is very obvious. Copper in copper oxide has two prominent edges or prominent peaks, but such feature is absent in metallic copper. We will come back to this shortly. The second is more subtle. If you look at the energy level with the onset of the ionization edges for copper oxide and the copper, there is a difference. This is termed as the chemical shift. Coming back to the two sharp edges you see from copper oxide. They are widely observed in transition metals and they are called white lines. White lines correspond to the energy levels of the L edges. You will see them when the element has unfilled D orbitals. In the example shown here, because metallic copper has filled D orbitals, that's why we don't see these white lines. For copper oxide, the D orbital electrons are grabbed by the oxygen ion. They become available, that's why we can see the copper white lines. It is very powerful to combine illness with STEM, especially the atomic level STEM. The example on the left was taken from the textbook and originally done by Professor Phil Batten. Down here is silicon, up here is silicon oxide. If you draw a line from silicon into silicon oxide, you will see the change from silicon to silicon 2 plus in the illness. The example on the right is to do defect analysis using eels on the 2D material. The work was done by Su and Naga and the co-authors, and the work was published in Physical Review Letters in 2012. The material here is boron nitride. You can see the areas labeled number one and number three are pristine areas with no defects. But at site number two, you can see a point defect, a vacancy. Looking at the EOS spectra, 
the ones from regions number one and the number three are the same. But for region number two, because there are dangling bonds now in the EOS spectrum, you see a pre-peak. It is amazing that the stem EOS can push the defect analysis to a new level. I will only spend one slide on the Excelps, mainly because I have very limited understanding on this topic myself. In Excelps, the ejected electron does not fill an empty state of the atom, but rather escapes outside the atom. The escaped electron will interact with the nearby atoms, thus provide the local structural information. The region highlighted in the box in the EOS spectrum is the Excelps. After removing the background and transforming that into the case phase, you see something like in B. If you perform the Fourier transform of B, then you get the radial distribution function. If you are interested in simulating the fine details in EOS spectra, you can purchase a software called FAF. FAF was developed by Professor John Rear and his team at the University of Washington. Before wrapping up the entire course, I'd like to share with you these two slides. The photograph you see here is the very first TEM. Nowadays, doesn't matter if you use Titan Themis Z or Gel Arm 200 or the Neon Stem, all the fancy TEMs are all the descendants of this humble, simple looking instrument. Then, who was the hero who built the first TEM? The hero's name is Ernst Raska. In 1906, he was born in Germany. He's one year older than von Arden. Von Arden was the person who built the very first scanning electron microscope. In 1927, Raska earned his bachelor degree in electrical engineering from the Technical University of Munich. In 1931, he demonstrated that magnetic coils can be used as electron lenses. Two years later, he built the first TEM as his PhD thesis. In the same year, he obtained his PhD from the Technical University of Berlin, and his advisor is Professor Max Knorr. In 1939, only six years later after the development of the first TEM, the first commercial TEM became available from Siemens. In 1939, Ernst Raska's brother, Helmut Raska, who is a medical doctor, started developing the use of TEM for bioapplications. This will lead to a revolution in structural biology. In 1986, Ernst Rusker won the Nobel Prize in Physics. Two years after receiving the award, he passed away. There's one little detail I'd like to draw your attention to. In 1933, when Rusker built the first TEM, he's not this old-looking gentleman in the photograph here. He was in his 20s when he developed the first TEM. He will more look like this. I believe many of the students who watch these videos are in your 20s and 30s. I hope what you have learned in these videos can help you better use TEM for your research. I wish you success in your learning, research, and career, and doing something great at a young age, like what Ernst Raska did. Congratulations for completing this online course, and cheers.